Hi, everybody. Welcome to, welcome to Wonders of Poetry with tertiary creative writing students. Uh, today, I'm going to be your host, Natasha, and joining me is Yi Tian, who's also a poet. We'll, be, we'll both be reading our poets this morning, actually. So we hope that you enjoy whatever's coming next. Right. So our first poet to present will be my co-host here, Natasha Suji. She's a web designer and poet from Indonesia. She's currently studying arts management. She writes extensively about declarative memory and about her experiences living in different regions. Thank you. My first poem is called Masakan Padang. Reintegration as curse and lost opportunity. There may be no reason to forget, but memories fail. Smog and acrid rain as my promise to come back. My mother, having eaten each finger, would not describe that anyway. My car sickness, angry heat, this understanding, cheap chocolate instead of the spectacles we could not afford. She hated that, lived experience. Even here we are tourists, purchasing the cheap handwoven baskets just to store our rotten fruit, posing for the foreign camera this way and that. Don't you know, Hatiku, that this is the pretension that'll fetch you all the food you ever want? Daily, I chew on that, insisting comfort. My father loved its simplicity, exotic, gentle poverty that will not escape. Why? Not as if we couldn't leave a trail from there to here. Stamped passports, hotel fees, sweet altitude of hiking up the neighboring hill. The power generator, smiling dimly. Slowness of the water faucet and faint language will pretend not to hear. My eyes, still swollen, do not track as well in this early dark. Though anything foreign can still be learned. Pesto and mortar, as I grind the bird's eye. Coming back home could mean a lot of things. No cell phone service, nor bank account statements to kiss me awake. Each morning, its own struggle to hold the wajan into the open. Eight hours to feed city folk who won't know what they're eating. Salted narrative, kobokan, and blood. For myself to remember the coolness of air, this boredom, unquenchable thirst and cheap desire of struggling with it all, for losing nearly everything. Thank you. That's my first poem, Masakan Padang. My next poem is called Shopping List. Idiot children and glamorous sorrow of my blister packs. Sickness and with the light stench of hunger is my brain. Doors opening, lights blown out. One more spoonful of chili and I'd be dust. Grand ocean of arrogance and drenched in dishwater, set on the floor, drunk of ice cream. And I am 12. There is nothing more delicious than running to be on time for school, despite lakes of salt and sugar for soup and breakfast. My sisters, lithe and dangerous and sensual, holding my eyeballs in their hands, watch but won't speak. Hundred dollar RMB bills I roll up as beef slices to sneak into their bosoms. Statuesque and the beach at night in all its touristic glory, gaudy with men crawling the white berth of sand, Pockets of dollars and coins falling from their monstrousness. I am crawling with mud in my mouth, and there is nothing more beautiful than waves as midnight, for the clock and its slow descent towards rawness is tomorrow. Crisp and inedible, and you couldn't put a face to it, but I spent most days walking with fistfuls of melted candy, sweet and sticky as the voices of yesterday. I touched everything I saw, like they were proof of my being there. The ruination of simple, basic things. In the house, there is no refrigerator to house the chocolate I sneak into my bedroom. So we eat everything while we still can. Eyeshadow as condiment and eye lick surfaces clean. Unearthed clothing, unswept room. No one can be here to stop me. Myself starving to become the same creature as my cat. Always. Fresh tuna tomorrow. I am short up here. 
no excitement nor violence to love me. Hunger itself is not that bad. Only the realization of viscous, tacky fingers, the drew of my shirt, my staining the tap as I turn it on. That's it. Thank you very much. Right. So you mentioned in your bio that you often write about your experiences living in foreign countries. So could you talk more about your first poem, or I mean both poems really, uh, and the struggle they present of belonging and alienation? Right. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, I think for Masakan Padang, uh, my first poem, it really stems from kind of almost being misunderstood. Right. Like. There's a lot of assumptions we make about other people. So when people look at me, I don't know what they're thinking, but half the time it's wrong. <laughs> so um, it's really about going back home. It's about going back home. It's about leaving things behind almost. Because sometimes, you know, living in a lot of cities, um, I've lived in many. I've lived in Shanghai, London, here, Jakarta. Um, that. Over time, it gets really suffocating. So, like, I just want to go home sometimes, but unfortunately, that's not where my life is right now. I need to come back. I need to do work. I need a job. I need to earn money to live. So, I think Masakan Padang is about a different kind of resurgence, right? It's where it's where sometimes things are not as good as it used to be, but it'll come back some way or another. My second poem, um, "Shopping List," is about mental illness. Actually, so for a while I was not functional as a human being. Um, I think, you know, we read a lot of poetry about mental illness, um, and one thing that struck me is that we rarely talk about how difficult it is to keep basic hygiene. Yeah, it's it's a struggle to wake up in the morning. To get out of bed, to brush your teeth and shower, and I think this is about that. So I chose this specifically for our theme of resurgence. Um, for this is a theme for our festival as well, resurgence, um, because it's just it's just that sometimes being better can be a lot of small little things as well. It could be turning on the tap. To take a shower, it could be coming out of the house. It could be finally picking up the phone when it calls. Yeah, hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think we can move on to our next poet, which is also my host today, Etienne. So Etienne is a second-year English literature student at NTU. She enjoys making zines, going to aquariums, and reading contemporary versions of myths and legends. Etienne, please. Thank you very much. I will be reading my poem called "Desire and Despair," but there's only one poem, but it's really long. So please bear with me. Okay, "Desire and Despair." Look with your eyes. All around you, love curls up around your feet like stinging nettles. Here, a smile to guide the gaze; there, a lie to hold a hand. The hollow promise of a ring without its finger. The wind hooks you back with its fingers around your throat. Each time, a different face, a different place. Your skin crawling up and down the wall as they scan you left and right. Your frame worn down by termites, bending backwards to please, to satisfy. Locusts gorging themselves on castle walls, a body ruined from the inside out. Breathe through the fever, swallow down this suffocation. Let me draw near to you. Spot shapes amongst your bruises like clouds, lightning twitching between your fingers. Let your guise melt now, with my eyes too close to your own. You need not repeat the death sentence. Yes, this is not trust. This is simply apathy. The way past wars entertain the future. Only an empty hand can hold another. Now look with mine. Even now, you drop an apology like loose change. It does not matter. I take it anyway. Wings waiting for their owner in the dirt. Hands shaking under a trickle of watered-down kindness. Fingers chasing after your afterimage. I see it all. What shall your charge be? The price of a tear. The wound of waiting. The fall from expectations. It does not matter. Every smile you give me wipes your slate clean. 
My thoughts are more like clouds, find themselves drifting ashore upon your palm. With the slightest breath, they stir themselves into a frenzy, a hurricane experiencing drought. Am I to believe that your concern never alighted upon my fears the way your fingertip brushes over tears, the way June stains the ears? Still, was it too much to ask? For a glance through the frost that I could hold like a wishing star, my words to settle in your soul, to catch your shadow. You can't teach old dogs new tricks, but even dogs recognize the hand that feeds them. With eyes open, I watch you chase another star. One day, time will wash away your touch like sand. Don't wonder why no one calls out for you then. Let us close our eyes, I say. But when I open my eyes, I find that yours have been open this whole time. When the nettle stung, you were there. When the wind lashed and flung me wide open, you were there. And when I stood there and let these things happen to me, you were there. I stood there and let these things, I was waiting for you to notice. Still, I leave the bruises wrinkling and rotting, too afraid to heal before you can apologize. Every time the waves crash upon the shore, my hope renews itself like a sunset, always fading, always beautiful, always ready to be noticed. I tell myself that time heals all wounds, even as I unconsciously pick at the scabs, reopening old grievances, revisiting unchanged habits, repeating waiting to be disappointed. I entertain thoughts of closing my eyes and leaving you in the dust while watching you the entire time. How much dust does it take to fill an eye? When will we learn to see? Maybe we have been grasping at clouds this whole while, trying to build castles from the ashes the termites have abandoned. The wind hooks you back with its fingers laced with yours, calling your name, but not quite. I turn around anyway. You are the second before impact, the moment of eye contact, the loophole in a contract. You are the spider and its venomous fangs. You are its silk and delicate heart. You are the yearning of the tide. You are the moon pulling on its ropes. You are the falcon and its tether. You are the cuckoo and its method. Slowly, you will come to see the ache of desire, the finality of despair, the aftertaste of shame after pleasure, the echo of a scream after a body falls. Only hurt can identify hurt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yi Tian. Would you like to share with us the, the context of your poem to begin with? Yeah, this poem was written... Okay, this poem is a revised version of an original one, which I wrote during a very potent time during COVID when I was full of fresh betrayal and guilt. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes, you know, in life, you expect things from people that people can't give. And you think, you know, if they cared enough about me, they would do this for me, but they really don't. And this poem is about waiting for something that will never happen, even though you see the potential, but that potential in that person is never going to be realized. And when you wrote this poem, did you have in mind that you're going to be sharing this poem with that person? Or did you write it like, oh, this person is never going to read it anyway? I wrote this poem about one of my friends who I used to be very close with, and he's a poet. So I figured that one day I would write this poem, which I did, yeah. and then I would put it into a zine, which I was going to sell, which I did. Very and good. because he's my friend, he would have to buy it to support me, which he did. So yeah, hopefully he has read this by now, although he will never realize that it's about him, despite how he is a poet, which I think is all super ironic and fun, <laughs> right? Like, if they traumatize you, you should just make money off them. I mean, if they're really going to hurt you, you should might as well just take a bit of money from their wallet. You should have, charged, hurt, right? you should have charged him higher then. Give him right? a special price. I should price. have said like, yeah, you know, for friendship <laughs> price. Normally people ask for a discount. Like, I should charge him more. I would have been like, yeah, this is my trauma price. Yeah, $50, please. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for sharing with us your poem. I think it's very nice and very powerful. Thank you very much. So let's start with our fellow poets. Um, Cha Xin Yi is a recent graduate of Yale NUS College and received her BA in Arts and Humanities with a minor in Philosophy. Her work explores the recollection and reimagination of memories, often through a gender lens, to make sense of her selfhood. Xin Yi, please. Hi everyone, today I'll be uh, reading two poems and the first one is titled In Full View. I'm this body of flesh and bones. I'm not your inched up gone skirt. 
I'm assuming the contrapostal. I'm not relaxed. I'm contrasted skin tones. I'm not contrasted arms or torso. I'm caught under the sun. I'm not displayed. I'm the clenched master muscle. I'm not direct eye contact. I'm the body your eyes devour. I'm not yours. Thank you. The second poem I'll be reading is titled "Therapy Notes About Before and Afters of Igorot Constabulary Soldiers." This story begins with an absence of time, an absence that bridged the distance between supposed potential and incompatibility, with the addition of the constabulary uniform, with potential already teetering between untruths of inherent lack and phantoms of positive, promise, civilizing effects. That could catalyze a necessary racial uplift. To the American hand that swooped in with such urgency and cleared our table, what are you escaping from? To approach with such force, you said, "This contact is merely friendly and can give people hope." But we said nothing about being part of this narrative. You don't see your lacks, and us as who we are, but that we lack and should be somewhere else. Do you have to view us through a certain lens? We are just other humans to exist. Nothing for you to analyze or observe. Know that the more energy you invest in analyzing us, the more you're allowing us. To anchor you, and we reject your special provision. Not everyone wants chaos and drama in their lives. Some prefer goodness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xin Yi. So, do you have any questions for Xin Yi? Yeah. Okay. So both of your poems seem to want to claim some sort of autonomy. Like to gain the ability to define themselves and their goals, could you elaborate upon this theme of interpreting others and the refusal to be interpreted? Thank you for your question. So actually, both of these poems are from a chapbook inspired by Philippine literature in the American period, which was a topic kindly introduced to me by Professor and Poet Lawrence Yipo. I attempt to challenge. The commonly held notion of an objective Western eye and a subjective non-Western other in documentation processes like ethnographies. So these poems are actually engaging with ethnographic photographs from a text written by Mark Rice that's titled "Dean Warchester's Fantasy Islands: uh, Photography, Film, and the Colonial Philippines." So I wanted to center. My persona around the voices of the Filipinos back then, and to also subvert the idea that、um, Americanism is the pinnacle of civilization that the colonial authority leaders were trying to put forth back then. So,、um, yes, I think it's very apt to say that it's kind of giving who would normally be thought of as marginalized. An alternative interpretation, but I also recognize that my positionality as someone who's not Filipino then means that I am reimagining、um, the gaps of what has not been said within the text, and also what is unseen within the photographs. Thank you very much.、Um, you. I'd just like to ask about you have a minor in philosophy. Yes. <laughs> How do you work that into your poetry? I think,、um, perhaps unconsciously,、mm. I'm always very curious into 
um, as to why I am particularly interested in certain topics. So, for example, with regards to memory coming up in my work, I'm very interested in the gaps of memory that, um, that allow us to reimagine certain life events and particular tendencies or thought patterns that one might have with regards to those life events. And I think also sometimes I use them as subject matters in my poems themselves. So for example, I'm very interested in Chinese philosophy. So I use some of the theories as uh, writing prompts when I feel like I'm in a creative rut. Thank you very much. Thank you. For your wonderful poetry. We really enjoyed it today. So let's welcome our next poet. Um, Gabriel Sim is a rising junior at Yale NUS College, majoring in philosophy, politics, and economics. She was able to develop her childhood passion for poetry through workshops and classes in university, and often writes poems and songs about the struggle of daily life, being in love, and growing up in the 21st century. This is her first poetry reading outside of college, and she hopes to participate in many more to come. Thank you. Thanks for introducing me. So um, I'll be sharing just one poem um, that I wrote for this event, uh, and it's called Sunburn. There's a dread that comes with sunrise, its yellow yolk threatening to show itself above the horizon, losing all peace of nighttime and the ignorance of sleep. As I toss and turn and fight for stillness and the rhythm of breath that serves no expectation, I am helpless to the slow warmth that climbs upon my cheek. For daybreak awaits our human pain, a reminder that hurt does not dissipate, away with the misty exhalations of dawn. I cast a cruel light on hidden scars and conversations I was running from and who I feared I would someday become. But as its radiance wears me down, I fall into strange, sweet surrender, carried by the lilting tide of time as I pass obediently from one breath into another. Just as light makes no protest in its fragile impermanence, painting each second of the sky in pink, purple, and blue. Now I awake and watch these wicked embers fade into their golden hues. I pray that I will someday find that there is strength in new beginnings. And when the day is over, that there is nothing more delicate than forgiveness and the unclenching of fists, and heavy lids permitted to close again. And so to those who take too much comfort in the deceptive silence of evening, may you one day turn to face the sun and give yourself the grace to feel the tenderness of a morning kissed goodbye. Thank you. Thanks very much for your poetry, Gabrielle. Um, I'd just like to ask as well, I see in your bio that you hope for more readings to come outside of college. Do you know what, what you'd be expecting? What are you trying to look for in these poetry readings? I think I just want to learn more from other people and like, um, just listen to um, the different themes that people tend to write about um, and like, through what mediums they choose to pre present their poetry. Um, I think it's really interesting because I've gotten to uh, listen to a lot of the work presented by some of my peers like, in school. Um, I think I learned a lot from them over the semesters, so um, it'd be fun to meet people and just to explore new ways of writing poetry. Yeah. What have your experiences with poetry been like so far? Um, sorry, what do you mean by that? Oh, I mean, because you mentioned that you have like poetry readings in class, like, is this a creative writing class or do you write often? Or, you know? Yeah, so my first like formal introduction into poetry um, was through like uh, a poetry class in in uni, and so we do a lot of like sharings and workshops and um, very in depth discussions as to like um, how we could improve each other's work, um, and just being exposed to very different writing styles, um, especially because we come from different academic backgrounds. So it makes it quite interesting um, to see what everyone is preoccupied with and uh, where they're coming from. So um, I think my experience with poetry has been quite diverse in that sense, um, but. I'm still kind of grounded in the same, in similar writing styles that I've been uh, exposed to growing up, but always challenged by um, new things that I'm reading. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Do you happen to kind of weave in the kind of lessons that you learn from your peers, from poetry readings in school, into your own writing? I think for sure. I think one of the main things that I've taken away from these workshops and these sharings was um, being more specific in um, weaving in personal experiences to, uh, to my writing, because um, I found that even though um, uh, the most personal and specific things could also be the most relatable um, and universally connecting things about people. So I think that's what I enjoyed a lot in reading my, uh, my peers' writing, and that's what I've been trying to incorporate more in my poetry as well. Thank you very much. Let's welcome the next reader, Audrey Wan. Audrey Wan is a second-year student pursuing communication studies at Nanyang Technological University. Previously, she studied at Raffles Institution under the Humanities Programme. Her first piece of creative writing was a letter to her fairy godmother at age five, requesting to exchange her new pair of shoes to a different size. She loves fantasy fiction, pop culture, and writing poetry in the notes app. Audrey, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. So I actually wrote these two poems for my creative writing poetry class last semester at NTU under the guidance of Prof. Bowie Kim Cheung, who was a really good teacher. Okay, I'll start with my first poem, Toenails. Sitting on the edge of the balcony, my grandma yanks her calf towards her chest without ceremony, leg gone limp as a rag doll's. Four squares of newspaper are laid out beneath her. Their ink settles like sweat into the doughy creases of her thigh, splintering into dark tributaries over a blue web of veins. The foot that she strains to hold up is splayed like a broken bird, five toes with five damp yellow crescents where the nail sinks into flesh, her heel moon white with calluses. She catches me watching and shoes me away, but I have already seen the tight flesh of her toes overripe like swollen fruit. The nail clipper's crooked metal tooth veers off the yellow husk of toenail and bites at air. She hunches her body around her pain, seals it within herself so it doesn't reach me where I stand. Tiny half-moons scatter over the newspaper as she works. When it is over, she folds the newspaper quickly into neat squares, tips it down the chute, afraid that I will hear the rattle of toenails plucked from aching feet. Thank you. Uh, my next poem is called The Sunset from My Window. Where I stand by the window, the light shifts and falls across my calf, setting three tiles on the balcony aflame. Seven o'clock stretches around me like a milk-drunk cat, its cool face half sunken in luxurious shadow, the other half a riot of red and gold. The sun has begun to set. So this is what humans thought of when we spoke the word glow for the first time. The luminous O sighed into bruising light. Hands with phone cameras stretched out trailing in the wake of the sun. The sky undoes itself to rise somewhere else and every one of us feels laden with earth. When I was in kindergarten, a plane passed over the playground one day and all the children lay down on the field to watch. Moisture seeped into our backs, day-old dirt clotting in our white sneakers. But not one of us cared because here was our chance to chase the arc of something glorious. With every sunset, there it is again. The grace of human faces tilted upwards for one long moment becoming innocent. Thank you. Thank you for your poem, Audrey. I'd just like to ask, um, do you take much of your poetic inspiration from your surroundings? Because I noticed that your poetry has a lot of you know, imagery in it, like sunsets or like looking at like a grandma, for example, the narrator. So how much of your poetry reflects things that you have seen or is this more from your imagination? Oh, these are definitely images that surface in my daily life. I remember in these moments, sometimes I can be filled with 
this inexplicable emotion. Like when I was watching my grandmother cut her toenails, I felt sad for a moment for some reason. And in that moment, I couldn't really articulate why I was feeling that way. But through writing these poems and being able to compress that moment into lyric helps me work through the emotions of that time. And I realized it's because of how close I felt to my grandmother and how sad I felt watching her hunched over cutting her nails and how it reminded me of the tumultuous past she must have had. Yeah, and with the sunset, I think it's something we take for granted. Like a lot of these simple moments with so much beauty in them. So I thought by writing this poetry, I could sort of trigger a resurgence of memory of emotion. And even though the experience of it might be different because it's tempered by time and reflection, at least it helps to surface the emotion that we felt when we were in the thick of it, experiencing it. Yeah. Thank you very much for your, for your explanation. I think what really struck me was the imagery of, you know, bending over to, to cut the, 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 the nails. Um, do you work a lot of that into your poetry? Do you draw from your personal experiences into all your poems? Yeah, I do. But I feel like it may make my friends and family worried because I'm always <laughs> observing. So if they even do something as simple as like combing their hair, I'm watching. And I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to walk into a poem. So my dad is here today, actually. I'm very grateful because he lets me observe what he does. Yeah. And he's featured in my poems before as well. Yeah. Does anybody ever confront you? Like, why, why are you writing about me painting my nails? I think so far no one has taken issue with it. But if I portray them inaccurately in the future, I'm open to them confronting me. Yeah. Very good for your father here to take yeah, yeah. note. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Let's welcome the next poet we have. Vanessa Tien is an arts and humanities graduate from Yale and US College. For her capstone, she published a webcomic titled Forgetting Better that explores memory and growing up. Her first poetry collection under the mentorship of Lawrence Epel is titled Phototherapy, which navigates skin, disease, and the body. She is a multidisciplinary artist who enjoys both the image and the written word. Vanessa, the stage is yours. Thank you. And thank you everybody for you know, your continued attention. Uh, unfortunately, one of my poems is on the longer side but there are two of them and the second one is a bit shorter. So the first one is called Blueberry. Okay. Afternoon, same deep die cut. My sister out for weddings. My friend's grandmother dying. As for me, it seemed time only turned as uneventfully as my body rolling across the bed or a word in slow tumble to the tip of the tongue like blueberry or please. And I somehow knew that for me at least, for now at least, growing was just as slow and wordless as that. Not blueberry, but blueberry. Not please, but please. Please, please. Please, blueberry. I'm me, I'm little, I'm yours. Split, wet, red, deep on the white kitchen table. Your irregular little blueberry. The day is hot and damp, out the freezer and into sweats. I'm afraid you'll hate my guts. I'm afraid you already dislike me. That with the coming of day, the sun will inch in and I will be blind and soft and good for rot. Softening like a mother, like you at first peel, hardening with the edge of fungus. I can't cry like it's blood forever. Please, please, I'm sorry. Here in the land of the nameless, I like to pretend I am no one and someone else as I grow into this soul not knowing how else to use my time, my name, syllables, leaves on my soft mouth. Time has revealed my mother to me, more than my own self, as if in her embrace could be the answer to it all, although she must kill with a thousand cuts first. As if her wounds were all made from this stitching of the world, the blanket of the night sky, as if it was all natural as could be, as ordinary as a blueberry melting in the heat as mundane as the stars turning hidden from sight, waving to no one, 
this purple gray sky, rain hanging on the zinc roof. Leaves are made of root in the end. I've thought that to flutter is freedom, sick of the branch only to realize how paltry, how poorly, how difficult it is to be alone, how something in me is always exploding even if I cannot see it, how I still haven't learned of the thousand colors in which love moves, how water vibrates even if I cannot feel it, how I cannot be air, how I cannot be smoke, how I cannot be nothing at all. In the end, doesn't it always go back to the same few things? Your bed is ready for you, little small soft blueberry, syllable soft on the flesh of today, for already yesterday has gone to sleep. So that's the first poem. Thank you. Uh, the second one is called Somnolence. I am propositioned. The world wants to be my lover again when I lay down at 5 p.m. Now the sky is yellow with ink, the curtains, a bird somewhere is lilting to me looking. Here is the blessed bridge in between living and a nap. Thinking becomes damp, mute, pliant. It's a towel heavy with clean, cool water that your mother runs over your face, stretching your cheek in the way you used to play the piano. You are young, you are old, this has been done for centuries, and you think you know at 5 p.m. why the world likes to keep its mysteries mysterious. You are loose to time, clodded together only by the earth of ancient intuitions and the faint angle of a half-opened window. All right. Cool. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so why specifically blueberry? Um... Well, previously you asked some of the poets, you know, about their inspiration from imagery. Right. Uh, yeah, and I'm a very visually oriented person. Uh, so I, I think it feels very natural for a creation to come out of an image as it's generated. Right, like yeah. some of your lines had like the yellow sky and everything. Yeah. Is this because of your multidisciplinary background? Do you, do you weave those two together? Right. Well, I, I, I probably flattered myself more than I should have when I called myself multidisciplinary. In, in reality, <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I just like both pictures and words, you know. So I think they naturally come together. So I feel that my process of like writing a poem is very similar to my process of like sketching a blueberry. Uh, but maybe words can kind of uh, cut a bit deeper to what images can suggest that only... I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> that answers my question. Right. Thank no, you. I was just curious <laughs> that you focus on like the rotting of the blueberry rather than, you know, blueberries are normally associated with like fresh harvest or something. But why rotting? You know, did you see mm -hmm. a rotting blueberry? Well, perhaps. Oh. <laughs> okay, but, um, I mean, I, I would say that uh, I, I feel that a lot of poetry comes from self-identification with like images and objects, right? I mean, I'm making a vast claim, um, but I think that the fact that I chose to sort of identify with a rotting blueberry more than a fresh, beautiful blueberry from the gardens of England was like a reflection of sort of um, the state of mind at the time, uh, because the first poem was a poem about growth and reckoning, and I feel that I identified more with, it is more human to identify with the rotting than flourishing to me at least. I also hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, but also why sands as the title when I didn't really spot sand in the poem? All right, sands was the original title, then I changed it to blueberry for that reason. Uh, I understand. But <laughs> originally it was sands because it was about time changing. Like you shifting know? sands? Yes, and the image you know, of like the hourglass. But that didn't really come through, so I changed it. Yes. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely poetry. Thank you. Let's welcome our next poet. Brian Yeo is a student at Yale NUS College. Apart from writing poems, Ryan also enjoys improv theatre, playing D and D, and petting dogs. Ryan, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan. I use he/him pronouns. So I'm going to read two poems today. Um, the first is called 
stocking up milk as an act of resistance. So this poem was written, um, so I'm from Yale West College and our school closed down and this was um, written in the aftermath um, of that. Stocking up milk as an act of resistance. Yesterday at 9.35 a.m., I carried six packs of milk up the stairs. I lined them up neatly on the bottom shelf of the fridge. Today I sat on the courtyard swing, closed my eyes for a few minutes and took a deep breath, smelt the grass, listened to the birds, how little they cared for the world. Tonight I will switch off my alarm and crawl under the covers. Tomorrow I will dream again about fighting back, about shouting until I cannot feel my throat or staying up till 4 a.m. to write what cannot be written, then about taking a rest or sighing into my hands, slumping into my seat or having a cold drink when I weep. How can they quell a movement whose people breathe in the spirit of resistance when even those sunk to the floor look up and still say, I have lost in all the ways you could not have hoped for? Thank you. That's stocking up milk as an act of resistance. Okay, so my next poem is called uh, Nuclear Winter. So this poem was about um, me imagining kind of like a post-human world um, and where the kind of creatures that will um, thrive in those places. Yeah. Nuclear Winter. Long after the last of humanity is wiped out from the nuclear winter, I imagine the roaches cautiously peeking their feelers out, refusing to believe the quiet. The scary part isn't seeing the human, they would recall their old folks' warning. It's when the human disappears. I imagine them speaking of a being who could summon the sun when you thought all was dark and safe, traverse vast spaces in a single stride, gather mysterious mists that would force any roach caught inside to flip over, flailing their legs until it falls asleep forever. The humans never sleep, they would tell each other. When they disappear, it is only a matter of time before they emerge again, before they call for the sun to hunt you down. I imagine it would take a while before the roaches trust peace enough to stop lurking, feel us up near their crevices, to host food cupboard parties, to venture across the living room floor. I imagine the veteran roaches telling their children about the beings powerful enough to bend light and air. They would lie awake at night, wondering about the extermination, the old warning tossing in their heads. Thank you. That's Nuclear Winter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, yeah, so the first poem has a lot of themes surrounded time. Is that something you deliberately put inside? I think, um, yes. I think you're, you're referring to like the specific times, yes, yes. right? I, I guess my intention of putting it in was more on like focusing on the minute details because um, I think this poem was a lot about like the ordinary, about the the little things that um, that just like um, like fi finding meaning in the little things, I guess. So like um, putting in these details, I guess, help to convey that. And I guess like just like I think in 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 that in moments of like chaos and like um, where things are messy, um, these things like start like these ordinary things start to stand out a lot more because you don't find peace and a lot of stuff. Right, like yeah. a literal fixture in time. I, yeah, you could say that, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Your next poem, um, Cockroaches, why, why Cockroaches specifically? It, it feels very, very much like nostalgia, almost. Um, okay, disclaimer, I'm not nostalgic about cockroaches. I do not <laughs> like cockroaches. Yeah, but I guess when I think about like, um, um, you know, cockroaches, they are like, you know, there's there's this like trope of cockroaches like being able to survive nuclear winters. So I guess like I that was my starting point. I thought they would. Oh, okay. I guess I could talk about like the origins of the poem. I was in the kitchen at like late into the night, and I turned on the light switch. I saw a cockroach, and I and I just thought like, 
what must the cockroach be thinking? You know, it's night and then suddenly like the sun is out. So that was my starting point, but it kind of also like fits in with how right. like cockroaches are resilient. Right. Can, because yeah. I was thinking that cockroaches are usually known for like, you know, they're resilient, they're everywhere, they also they'll outlive you. Like they're very determined creatures. So I was thinking about why in your poem, like you presented cockroaches as being like, you know, like pretty afraid or clueless about how humans operate. Mm, I and I think in reality, or at least maybe the cockroaches that I've encountered are just particularly rebellious. Like they don't really care whether I'm there or not. <laughs> right. Right. Like right. one time I was cooking and then there was a cockroach on the stove. It was this big. It just stared at me. Cockroach. I just stared back. I left. Did you kill it? <laughs> Who killed it? My father. What Wonderful. a brave soul. <laughs> yeah, I, I would not dare to touch the cockroach. Um, I guess like, um, I'm, I, I, I wouldn't say I intended for the cockroach to be helpless. Um, but I was thinking about how the cockroach must have like seen humanity or like how... Um, yeah, because I guess humans have kind of like trampled all over the natural world, um, how we have like dominated over like natural beings and spaces. And I guess um, like I was just trying to put myself in like the place, in the place of maybe a cockroach, like how would they have seen this kind of domination, um, this kind of... Um, yeah, I, 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 I guess I would Like the overlords of the world are gone, <laughs> kind of thing. Kind of, yeah, I, yeah. So you're it, the overlord in the cockroach world. I wouldn't say that I was the overlord. Like I, I okay, I don't have the words right now, <laughs> like to phrase this, but it's like, yeah, I wouldn't say that we are, or, or like we are the rightful overlords. We, I don't think we are, um, but, um, yeah, I guess I, I wouldn't think I would think some of the cockroaches would feel afraid as well because. Like things have changed so much in in like in the short time that humans have like you know been on the earth. Thank you very much, yeah. Ryan, for your poetry. Thank you. Let's welcome our next poet, Uy Kedong, who is a lover of many things: cats, Ghibli films, pleated trousers, and Harry Styles. His first love affair, however, has always been writing. Having emerging from a year-long hiatus, he's delighted to be back and to be able to present all new pieces from his latest endeavors. Kadong, please. Hello, hello, thank you. Uh, okay, I shall begin. Okay, this poem is called uh, Ode to Uniqlo Boy. So, to break up with the Uniqlo Boy is to break up with half of Singapore. He lives on in every squarish silhouette every drab shade of beige, grey, navy, pink, purple, and that one olive one which reminds you of the army shirt that you wore once and still haven't returned. You told your friends the problem was that Ming Hao is just too hard a name to moan, but you tried anyways, tongues tied at the void deck in front of an audience of steely-eyed cameras, mortified neighbourhood cats, and that one old uncle who told you afterwards that he didn't watch, but you thought you saw peeking from the lift lobby anyways. Those were the days of Gaia Toast split for two, of Netflix parties and borrowed hoodies, of midnight walks around the block, because to venture into his home would be to incur the watchful wrath of his mother and his grandmother and his grandmother's mother's village portrait and long escalator hugs. Hugs that were as long as it took to get from the deepest, darkest basement to the highest of sun-drenched roofs, but never seemed to be quite long enough, huddled together, head to chest, with the desperation of two shipwrecked refugees. Those were the days before his new bus cut began to prickle your skin, and the phrase, Sergeant is coming, became so regularly exchanged that this camouflage-clad phantom even began to creep into your waking dreams, lecturing you in your sleep about the obscure definitions of BMT, SOC, and IPPT. And so you broke up with him, not because he seemed indifferent 
to the difficulties of bidding for modules or the interpersonal intricacies of your freshman orientation group or how he was always jealous of your, your study buddy Mark, whom you once re remarked quite thoughtlessly, had quite a moldable name. But because he was too busy playing soldier in some misty forest to attend your 20th birthday. But even three years, two boyfriends and a pandemic later, you find yourself feeling a bit nostalgic for the times of Netflix parties and bored hoodies, midnight walks and sun-drenched roofs, and the sensation of being enfolded once again in the silky sm smooth fabric of a Uniqlo t-shirt. Right. That is my poem. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Are you going to ask me questions? Um, you are dressed head to toe in Uniqlo. Uh, no, no. Uh, this is Uniqlo. This is the, the olive one. You are wearing the <laughs> precise <laughs> olive No, no, but this, this is from H&M. And this pants, they're from Muji. And oh, so like, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mix of the, the, the three biggest <laughs> wholesalers in Singapore. Fashionable. Thank you you. want to represent your poem in some way, yeah. you know? Uh, do, you, I, I, do, you dress, the average. <laughs> do you dress specifically to avoid the Uniqlo? Uh -huh. Oh, no, no. I, I dress to embrace the Uniqlo. <laughs> because right. I, I'm, I'm the biggest uh, customer. Right. So, so about your poem, was it in yes. any way inspired by real life experiences? Oh. You know, what with the very direct <laughs> shirt <laughs> reference that I am witnessing with my own eyes right now. Um, well, I mean, it, it's meant to be provocative. It's meant to provoke. Um, answer is... Yes, but I can't reveal who and what it's based on because that would be mean. But for sure, I, I think these experiences are, are quite universal. It's not meant to offend anyone uh, except for people who deserve to be offended. But <laughs> it, The people hugging on the escalators? Uh, no, yes, those, those guys. No, I'm cool with them. They're okay. They just make me very uncomfortable. Maybe you'll catch the subject in a Uniqlo store. Oh, yes. I, I go to Uniqlo stores to look for people. <laughs> yeah. You do? No, no. That's a very interesting place to look for people. Thank you. It sells everything. It's in between your T-shirts. You open one and, oh, there's a person here. Hi, my name is Kedong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's me. I just live there and, and sleep there and eat lunch there. And what, what else oh. do you do there? Hug, hug people on escalator there? Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know the, the escalator in, in Uniqlo and Orchard, you know, that goes from level one to level two. Yeah, you, you can have like a little this break. It's a very Ollie specific escalator. <laughs> <you're> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the escalator on my mind when I was writing this. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So how much of your poetry is based on your personal experiences, would you say? Um, quite, quite a bit. Yes, because uh, I, I, I don't have a lot of imagination. I, I can't really imagine beyond myself, which is my own failing. But uh, yes, I, I, I tend to draw from my own experiences. Thank, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you for the clarification. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Kado. Thank you. Let's welcome our next poet, Andy Winter, who uses they, them, she, her pronouns is a non-binary trans-feminine ice goddess. They recently graduated from NTU with a Bachelor of Arts in English Honours and a minor in Creative Writing. They are interested in queer acts and ephemera, as well as the intersections of poetry, performance and drag. Their works have, been, uh, have appeared in Ada, Stellium, Strange Horizons, NB Live and Be Stung, among others. Find them chilling at whispersinwinter.wordpress.com. Andy, please. 001 Balbathor. A strange seed was planted on its back at birth. The plant sprouts and grows with this Pokemon. Pokemon leaf green. You were always there long before I left home. My fingers stretched towards you growing gnarly and life as they dug deep into soil and sand, the way a cactus knows nothing of tenderness since it was a seed. Only thirst. You were groundwater swelling from my sternum, washing thorns off my skin. 
you who broke the dry spell, who crowned me in petals, you who spoke the language of mirages. With a voice I never heard before, no other oasis was as cold or as sweet as you. I drowned in you, Andy, only to bloom pinker than Priscilla, queen of the desert. 350, Milotic. It is said to live at the bottom of large lakes. Considered to be the most beautiful of all Pokemon, it has been depicted in paintings and statues. Pokemon Emerald. Once upon a time, I walked on land amongst men. You could be me, I could be you. I had no face, no hair, no nails, no name. Always the same, yet never the same. Once upon a time, I was egg without embryo, shell without story, shaped like echo, cup to ear. Once upon a time, I gave my feet up to the ocean, watched them dissolve into sand and tide. People always ask how long I have grown my hair out for. How do I care for it? How do I tell them that I spent years sleeping within shipwrecks and shoals, that my tresses swirled in shades of sea foam, that I was born of brine and whalebone, my nails are harpoons lacquered in coral, adorned with treasures buried in carcasses of driftwood? How do I write my body without using images of the ocean? My body drifts in the ebb and flow of time. I never understood why that Danish mermaid gave up swimming to walk on knives, her voice for a man. Unlike her, my tale does not have an ending. 131 Lapras. People have driven Lapras almost to the point of extinction. In the evenings, it is said to sing plaintively as it seeks what few others of its kind still remain. Pokemon Emerald. My cosseted in whirlpool and whalebone. My all carapace and no blubber. My swims without schools. My is a lone American World War II bomber returning to base. My freckled with bullet holes. My shrapnel. My mistaken a symbol of resilience. My Mistakes anchor for torpedo, my, a mistake, my, at stake, my, as image of survival, my, on pedestal, my, plural, my, not boy, my, not brave, my, is not a, my, numbered, my, sings the languages of boats, sings the language of boats, my, sometimes forgets how to breathe above water. My is both hovercraft and harpoon, both failure and possibility. My breaking surface. My is war cry and swan song. My is a fossil from the future. Look at my, how big, how blue, how beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I love your hair. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful hair. <laughs> what? Why Pokemon? Um, I think. Well, aside from being a Pokemon fan, I felt that um, Pokemon was very apt as a thematic frame for my body of work, which is kind of invested in queer lives and queer experiences and just queerness in general. And I felt like I mean. I think that Pokemon is very queer in the <laughs> sense that these you have these creatures that are evolving and constantly changing, and it's I kind of feel like that's the perfect metaphor or like analogy to describe transness, trans bodies, queer bodies, or just bodies that are constantly shifting, changing, and deviant. In right, that like sense. the fluidity. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> you mentioned um, that you have a body of work that's really about queerness. Um, how, how, do you, how do you invoke that queerness in your poems? Uh, well, for me, I see queerness as not an identity category, um, but more as like a movement of a specific body in relation to just, yeah, like how the self is situated within like the network of other people, other bodies, other things, other spaces. 
So I think for me, the way poetry, op I, the way I operate in poetry is also about like, what kind of bodies are taking up space and moving through time and space as well. And I guess that's where I kind of write from. Yeah, a lot of what I write from is about queer desire, um, grief as well, because, you know, loss and just the movement of bodies. Yeah. yeah. Very interrelated, very relative to each other. Yeah, I feel like you can't really separate or isolate anything because everything's just so caught up in this, like, the web of life, as one might call it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Just a casual question. Do you theme your t-shirt to your poem? Because I remember on oh. your poem there was a mermaid in it. Uh, I think I have very mermaid-like tendencies <laughs> in real life. Um, I think I chose these three particular poems, of course, thinking of the theme which was resurgence. So I think naturally like the ones that are heavy with like imagery of water and fluidity kind of rise to the surface. Aha, uh -huh, get it, resurgence. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, because like I'm, I'm like an entomology person. I'm like, oh, like search and the idea of resurgence, not just in like the literary, me the literal meaning, but like in terms of renaming, retelling, and reconstruction. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Okay, so. We've all have our poets have finished reading their poetry, so we'd like to ask them to come up in batches to discuss their poetry process with us a little more. Maybe we can have Etienne here, Xin Yi, Gabrielle, and Audrey come on stage and have a chat with us. <laughs> yeah, you guys will have to share one mic because we only have so many. You are part of the panel. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So we'd like to ask, what is your process like for poetry? Uh, I feel like I always, if I'm struck by inspiration, then I'll do it in one sitting. But sometimes it can come in spurts and it can be the most laborious process ever. So it depends on the state of mind I'm in, how fresh the experience is, whether I'm in the mood for it. I think it's probably the same for all of you. Mm. Yeah, I think very similar to Audrey. Um, like especially when you know it's like two a.m. and then you get like a really sudden burst of like grief or anger, and you just take out your notes app, and then you just like go off. Um, but I think uh, very much like what I did for the poem that I just read, I think sometimes um, I like to work in couplets and then just like save them for later and then like meditate on like a feeling and try to compress like a, like in, like a visual that I have in my head and then just like save it for later and then just weave all these little couplets together into like a poem. Um, I think for me, a lot of the poems, or most of the poems that I've written are for class. So uh, thankfully, Professor Yifo gives a lot of very great writing prompts, and I use those to uh, start off my poems. But I also draw very heavy from my personal experiences, and I use that um, as a frame when I write my poetry. I think sometimes I feel like I'm not a real poet because every time I write a poem, it's always because of a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if like I just don't write poetry until one day I go for class and then the teacher is like, right, so a portfolio is due next week. Have fun and I hope look forward to seeing all your poems. And I'm like, oh yes, I'm supposed to present all three poems. Haha. <laughs> and then I start writing the last one. And then I realize the first two are not as great as the last one. And then I have to rewrite those two. So sometimes whenever, you know, there's like creative writing portfolio, you have to submit three poems. I always end up with like six. And then I realized that I exceeded the word count because my poems are all so long. And then I have to rewrite them all over again. Well, variety is the spice of life. Right. So honestly, I feel like sometimes I just write based on deadline. Like the more stressed I am, the more the brain juices flow. It's like when you crush a peach, you know, like 
that's where it comes from. So yeah, but sometimes you just get random flashes of inspiration in a day. So I'll just take that down and send it to myself in Telegram. <laughs> you know, just like a little, hi, remember this image you had of seagulls on this one day in July? And I'll be like, oh yeah, it's time to work that into my next poem. And then I'll pull out all the images I had and then I'll just scroll through and be like, this is good. This is not as good. What was I thinking when I had this image? And then it goes on. So do you guys write very close to the deadline? Yeah. <laughs> very honest. Thank you very much for your honesty. Yeah, like, for example, I was in the creative writing program, or at least the module in NTU, and one day I wrote a poem for that class that I thought was really good, but the problem was that it was 2,000 words long. Can you imagine? Like, that's the length of a normal literature essay, and I was like, this is a bit much. So I decided to scrap the whole thing the night before my submission, and I wrote a new one. So it's all about that pressure, guys. Was it still 2,000 words long? No, it was only 1,000. Great. <laughs> Do you have to read it in class? Embarrassingly so. Do all of you read your poems out loud in class? What's the, what's the feedback like from your classmates? Sometimes our prof just puts us on the spot and then he makes us read whatever we have. Like He'll give us like five minutes to just write something out of a prompt and then he, he will just like make us say it on the spot, no matter how bad it is. Yeah, but he takes it very seriously. So. No, it's not bad, it's just creative. <laughs> That's what I tell myself too. Creative writing. Yeah. That's right. I think sometimes reading uh, my poetry out loud makes me revisit it in a different light because sometimes the cadences, the acoustics of it make me think, oh, okay, the, the rhythm here isn't as good. Or maybe I should change the wording around. And it helps that you can see people react to it in real time. Yeah, Yeah, I feel like sometimes when you read your poem out loud, you realise that when you read it in your head as well, like visually, it also sometimes isn't as smooth. So reading out loud really helps you with like how it appears on text as well. Right, and the rhythm and the language as yeah, well. Yeah, and sometimes when you read things out loud, you realise how cringy some of your pretentious <laughs> phrases are and then you gain a new opportunity to go correct those yeah yeah it's, it's nice to read it out with other people because like different different audiences or different people hook on to different parts of the poem that you didn't think was going to be interesting so yeah uh, similar to what gabby said because we also had a lot of experiences where our professor made us uh, read what we wrote on the spot. I think reading it out, out loud helps me decide the line breaks as well. And um, similar to what you shared, certain phrases that maybe sounded better in our head <laughs> when it came out. Yeah, I feel like sometimes when you, oh, especially because you guys mentioned um, you have to write on the spot and then within like a few minutes or so, you have to present what you just wrote. I feel like within the first few times, it's very daunting because I was from like an English-related CCA for six years from high school to junior college. And, you know, of course, when I'm in high school and I'm like year one and all my seniors in year four are writing really great stuff, I feel like, wow, because that was my first encounter with poetry. And the first one I ever wrote was about um, a lost sock. So you can imagine how I feel when I submitted that poem and then I realized everyone else in my seniors were all writing poems within 20 minutes that were about like war and like loss and grief and I was like, oh, I should not be writing about dancing skeletons. But you know, after a while you, you just realize that sometimes writing within a short period of time and being able to share that is very fun because there's a lot less pressure when you know everyone else is faced with the same Stressful circumstances of a 15 minute writing exercise. Oh no, he gives us five minutes. <laughs> yeah, he gives us five, yeah. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah. Dude, does he write something too? No. That's, no, he just watches. That's very hypocritical. Oh, yeah. You ought to make them write too. Yeah. I, uh, I think what is interesting also is that when you're forced to write in such a short period of time, you notice that you have a certain set of vocabulary that comes out and then that can then help you like structure your poems them thematically. And then sometimes it helps in the direction of your chapbook as well. Great, thank you so much for answering our questions. Let's have the next batch of poets come up and, and share more.
Okay, yes, so we're just going to ask you the exact same question that we just asked the previous batch, you know, for fairness and equality and also because I'm very curious. So what are your writing processes or experiences like in general? Okay, uh, I, can, I can start. Um, so for me, I would say I'm primarily a more visual person actually. So I approach writing like I would approach sketching an object. So there is no end goal. You kind of improvise as you go along. You go with the beats. Um, and um, I sort of sort of just go around an object. Um, I notice some poets like for like Gabby, for instance, I feel I admire those kind of poets because they can go straight to the heart of something, but I'm more of a questioner and kind of circle around. So, so you that. approach like your poem subject matter from like a bird's eye view kind of thing? I would say from like a, um, maybe like a painter's view, kind of stepping back and forth. Okay, so for me, I don't think there is a one process. Um, I think it depends. Um, there are some poems that I write, like going in, having an idea of what kind of theme I want to explore. There are some poems where maybe I write to figure stuff out, so I'm kind of figuring it out as I go. Um, so I, I don't think for me that there is one answer. Um, and I think in the last year or two, I've taken like classes that helped me like um, explore like what else can poetry be like what um, how can I um, expand my creative processes yeah so yeah I, that's not like a super satisfying answer but my answer is like yeah it depends yeah you know like do you normally write on impulse or do you have like a schedule you know some people set aside like one hour a day every day to write I know that sounds insane but I don't know I couldn't do it do, do you I don't have a schedule um I usually write when I feel like it. There are some uh, periods of time where I have more time where I, where I will like be like, okay, um, I have time. Let me like sit down to write poems tonight, for example. Um, but it's not um, for me. It's not like a oh, this time every day kind of thing. So for me, I I kind of agree with with what he mentioned that, that, that there's really no one way to write a poem. So. You know, like uh, I, I've written poems that have taken like months and like up to a year to like complete because it's so filled with like, you know, traumatic and repressed memories and like grief and like writer's fuel. And then sometimes I like just like drink a lot of coffee and then like like this poem I like, you know, at 6 a.m. yesterday, I was 6 a.m. today. I was like, oh, okay, poem time. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'm done. You know, let's get on with life. So, you know, it, it, everyone's process is different and uh, yeah, there's, there's really no one way to go about it. Uh, I think my poetics are fundamentally from a point of survival. <laughs> so for me, like, I think poetry is like the language where I can feel like alive and I can breathe compared to, I guess, language of like the everyday and the mundane. And like in that sense, like to me, poetry is everywhere. It's kind of like air, like... Uh, receipt or a grocery list can be a poem to me and even though I, I, I chose poems today that were prose poems, I like, I tend to like experiment with form so like uh, I'm a very visual oriented person and I like to think I write for the page but there's also like just a different nuance when you read poems out loud like for the stage or just breaking the boundary of this flat plane, right? Um, yeah, so there's always this, I guess, interest in breaking genre or just breaking whatever existing boundaries are there and pushing the limit of what language can do for me. And if it does something for like the reader or just anybody who is consuming art or poetry, then hopefully it's also a meaningful connection. And I think that's what I am more concerned with, not necessarily people understanding what the poem is, but people feeling yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I was just going to ask the next question, which is, do you guys find yourselves, you know, like always writing about the same few themes? Or are there any particular themes that you really enjoy or anything? <laughs> um, 
it is with regret that I find that I tend to write from a place of loss or grief. And it's something that I'm kind of trying to not say avoid, but I would like to hopefully write from a place of joy and I guess like radical hope in the future. But yeah, I tend to just go back to like the loss of things. Like there's this whole um, Jeanette Winterson quote about like, why is love and loss always measured together? And I feel like I, I'm, I keep invariably falling into that, which kind of says more about my life, sadly. <laughs> but hopefully, like, you know, not everything's about suffering. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I. So for me, I I think that there are generally two different kinds of poems that I tend to write. One one are one are light poems and one are dark poems. And so dark poems are, uh, you know, the Jeanette Winterson, you know, like lost grief, sadness, things that are are intensely personal. Um, but the other side that there are light poems. So like poems like maybe like just now, uh, tends to be more uh, lighthearted. I think because. You know, at a certain point in my life, I was like, you know, uh, I, I can't keep writing sad things. I, I, I would like my life to be joyful and bringing joy to people and, and you know, like kind of the Santa Claus kind of vibe. So that, that's what I'm uh, going towards. Thank you. Uh, so I think I usually write poems uh, that, that tend towards um, what is going on in my life, what's the dominant like, kind of like feeling or event that I'm going through. So it changes as I grow. Um, yeah, so I think like now, for example, the theme of like loss, grief um, is like showing up more because um, I think it's it's something that is an emotion that I'm experiencing a lot but, like more recently, but like it does evolve. Um, and although I did notice that like, like some images I, I use quite often, like um, the ocean appears a lot in my poems. It didn't appear in the two that I presented, but um, it does appear a lot, the sun also, um, or like small ordinary objects um, appear a lot in my poems. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Ryan and I think implicitly with everybody uh, about the autobiographical nature of poetry. I mean, I took I took the poetry class with, that some of us took as well with Professor like Lawrence DePaul. We came across a quote that mentioned about how poetry is the genre that most people would assume is the most autobiographical compared to other genres. Um, and I think naturally we draw from poetry as like sustenance, like therapy in some way. So I would say like the life is not consistent and people are not consistent. So naturally your poetry will not always be consistent. But for me, uh, what is usually the most consistent is cadence, um, sort of the musicality of it. And I think that would be what distinguishes poetry from prose to me at least. So that is what I find the most reliable going into poems. From Thank you for your answers. Um, I forgot to answer them myself. I'm actually part, I'm, I'm one of the poets. I need to answer this too. Um, what, what was the first question? <laughs> the first question was, I think, about their processes, their creative writing processes, you know, schedule, inspiration and all. And the second is about themes, right? Okay, so for poetry, I only write poetry at like, when I'm tired of my work at 3 a.m., you know, you, yeah, I'm designing websites at 3 a.m., like halfway through the website breaks, and you're crying and you don't know why it won't show up on Google. Therefore, the perfect time to write a poem, is it not? Right? Yeah? You can write it off all the broken code. Don't, 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 don't say that to me. <laughs> don't say that to me. That's, that's evil. Um, but yes, um, I don't actually write poetry that regularly. Um, it is only in between website projects <laughs> that I write poetry. Like, you know, um, I, I just am so stuck with my usual work that I kind of resort to poetry, which makes me feel a lot better than, than you know, sitting there refreshing the page and asking myself why. Um, so, so in that sense, um, my process is really just to wait until things break and then therefore I can have a break and therefore I can write like a little allowance of time. In, 
<laughs> yes, yes, a little treat, a little treat. Um, in terms of themes, so, so what I find interesting about this discussion so far is that the idea of the autobiographical nature of poetry, but actually in my poems, I, I do draw from my own experiences and themes from you know, my everyday life, but um, I think one key feature in my own poetry is that I try and make um, the speaker the persona in the poems as vile as possible. So as pitiful, as sad, as like, you know, um, because I think that in itself is a challenge, you know. Um, we all know that people write very angsty poetry, right? Like, like your first poem, you're like, oh my God, I had my heartbreak, my girlfriend broke up with me and now I can't live anymore. Um, so it has been kind of a challenge for me in that regard to write about to, to write specifically a speaker that is not that nice. It's not like, you, like it rejects um, the idea of being liked even uh, in my poetry. I, for today, I didn't, I didn't prepare any of those because they are quite pitiful, um, but it, it's a very nice way for me to try and challenge my language. How do you show in poetry this person who is absolutely awful, you know, is, is, is this kind of awfulness able to present itself as something beautiful in terms of language, in terms of poetry? Um, and as for the themes, I think that's part of it as well. Like, I just, I just write poetry, um, make, it, make it as unlikable as possible and see what I can do with the language, what I can do with with, with where it's at. And I think part of that is because I am not part of um, English affiliated or language affiliated um, degree program. So um, outside of my 3 a.m. poetry writing, I don't touch poetry at all. I mean, of course, except for this program, but that's about it. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Um, you. I think that's. Uh, <laughs> hope you all had a good time. You did too. Yeah, we had a great time listening to all your poetry. So I think that's going to be the end for our program, um, Wonders of Poetry with Tertiary Students. Um, we hope you enjoyed us. Uh, for those of you who are here in the audience, and for those of you that has joined us in the live stream. Um, we'd also like to extend our heartfelt thanks to National Arts Council for helping us make Poetry Festival Singapore 2022 possible. So thank you very much. Programs coming up soon, so stay tuned.